Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar on techniques for wildfire detection and monitoring. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and I, along with my colleague Amber McCullum, will be your presenters for today. This is the second session of a two-part series, and this one is session A. We will be repeating this session at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time later on today. You only need to attend one session per week. All webinar recordings, presentations, exercises, and the homework assignment can be found after each session on our website listed here. After each session, we will have a Q&A session. Josh Picotte, who gave last week's webinar, will join us for this week's Q&A session if you have any additional questions about the fire mapping tool he presented. You can also email either Amber or myself at our email addresses listed here. There will be one homework assignment for this course, which will be available after this session. The homework deadline is August 2nd. In order to receive a certificate Certificate of Completion, you must attend both live webinars and complete the homework by the deadline. You will receive the certificate about two months after the completion of the course. There are two prerequisites for this course, although they mostly apply to the webinar that was offered last week. You must have completed the fundamentals of remote sensing sessions available on our website or something equivalent. If any of you did not participate in the webinar last week and plan on watching the recording, you must also download and install QGIS. As I stated previously, you can access all our course materials on our website listed here. Last week, Josh Picot gave you an overview of the fire mapping tool. This week, I will be giving you some information and a short demonstration on the Global Wildfires Information System, or GWIS. For today's agenda, first, Josh will complete the exercise we began last week, picking up where we left off on part three. Then I will give an overview on the Group on Earth Observations, or GEO, followed by an overview of the Global Wildfire Information System. I will describe some of the GWIS features, and then my colleague Amber McCullum will do a short tutorial on the system. So I will hand this back over to you, Josh, to take us step by step through the remainder of the exercise from last week. Over to you. Thank you, Cindy. Great to be back. Today we're probably going at a pace that may be too quick for you to follow along, but we're, just remember that we're recording this presentation, and the presentation will be posted in the next 24 hours, so you'll be able to watch it at your leisure and complete the exercise at that point. As you recall from last week, we left out the conclusion of step two. We'll now start on step three, which allows you to manually threshold the low, moderate, and high burn charity breakpoints. The tool also, when you did the uh, subset process, it selects threshold. Now the thresholds are going to be different depending on how you trace the imagery, depending on pixels are in the image. There's all sorts of things that can affect this. So what you see in your window may be slightly different from what is in the manual. Um, in the manual, for what, whenever I map this, it said 63, 328, 516. You know, those are different from these, but they're similar. So probably okay. There's also a no data threshold, which is anything under 9, 970, and increased greenness. Increased greenness is generally my, minus 150 or less, down to negative 970. If you want to change this, you can. We generally don't. So you then let's just take a look at the threshold that the tool produces automatically. I should say threshold complete. Okay, you can get rid of this offset. You don't have this in your project if you don't want. Uh, I usually just save it. I usually just save the project and then go into here to find the threshold in the image. It should be called DNDR6. Yeah, so let's bring that in here. So let's take a look at this image. You don't want this border showing up. You can right double click on the image, double click on the zero, 
whoops, sorry. Uh, and then you can. Oh, I know. Sorry, that was the wrong one. You can then go to transparency and set the additional value to zero. You haven't really changed anything. It just show only shows values that are different than zero. And so you'll see that the tool has automatically masked it and masked the scan gap and threshold it for you. You can see that these uh, areas of high severity line up pretty nicely with these darker red areas. So it's looking pretty good. Maybe not perfect. There's low and moderate. Um, again, it's kind of have to look to see if, even, if it looks pretty reasonable. It looks pretty good, but um, again, these are default, so you may want to actually um, actually calculate um, that potential threshold. So we're going to do that now. So you can take out your or move it to the bottom. I'm not going to be using this threshold image for a second. Go back to your fire folder. Again, if you forgot where it is, just go to open event folder. I'm just gonna pop open my MTBS9 folder. I'm going to bring in three files. The DMBR, that these are the DMBR and the RDMBR. And also the postfire NBR, which is the Lantet 7, which is this one, not reflectant NBR. So I'm just going to pull and drag those in here. So you can show that, yeah, they're not showing up correctly. I mean, they're not necessarily showing badly. It's just that you need to change the range and variables. So we're going to go through this really quickly. So we're going to go to right-click on the DMBR, go to Properties, Style, go to Pseudocolor, now, the minimum is mega32768. Mega32768 is the no data gap value. So we don't want that. We actually want something less. So what I'm actually going to do is go to transparency and type in mega32768. So those are now transparent. And then I'm going to go to style and change this value. At most, mega500. You know, I might. And then I could also. Increase this to a thousand. Um, we're going to set the color interpolation to discrete. And you'll notice that right now it's set to gray, which is good. So you could select other colors if you want to. We just could use gray. We want the, the uh, higher values to show up as white, so we're going to hit invert. And then you'll notice that the mode is continuous. We're going to set this to equal interval. And it automatically defaults to five. Let's create classify and apply. So now your image looks a lot better. You can see these no data values. You can see the scan gap values are around it. These are the buffered values around it. So it's looking pretty good. NBR, we're going to do something a little bit similar. Discrete. I might change the values, you know, negative 500 to whatever, 1,000. Oops, I forgot to do the equal interval, classify, apply. So if we look at MBR, yeah, still not looking perfect. So oops, that's because you said that to 1,000. That's because you said to 100, not 1,000. Sorry about that. We're going to hit apply. And it's still not perfect, um, but you know we're getting a little bit better. You can always look at the original NBR as well by clicking on the full scene post fire, which is continuous. You can see it looks meh, it's fine. We're well, going to do the same thing um, to the RDR in just a moment. But the first thing we're actually going to do is alter the DMBR image again. So go to properties. I'm going to change these values a little bit, make it a little bit narrower from negative 200 to 900. I'll make sure this is discrete and change this to equal interval. I'm going to change the classes to 23. 
And I hit classify and apply. Okay, so let's look at what happened. The DMR. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. You can see the fire scrub pretty nicely. Oh, I forgot to invert it, so I might hit invert. 23, classify, apply. That looks better. Now you can see those values pretty nicely. So if you look at the intervals and your uh, manual will say something a little bit different, it's, again, depends on the imagery. You see that values range from negative 200 to 900, and there are intervals of 50. DMDR values. So now we're going to actually kind of figure out um, how we actually want to start to color the images for the um, low breakpoint. So we want to duplicate this image that we just did, the DMDR image. So we right click on it and hit uh, duplicate. And then I'm going to, so this is the exact same. You, Go between these, they're probably going to be exactly the same. They're the same. So I also kind of would like to rename it so I just know what, which one is the duplicate. And that's this one, actually. So we can go um, rename, just type in duplicate, you can do whatever you want. So I'll make sure that the boundaries are the same, so we're going to it. And make sure we classify it. Okay. So duplicate and the original are the same. I'm going to duplicate the top. I'm just moving it and moving it on below it. Okay. So we've got a duplicate DMBR image. Now we're going to calculate the low severity value. So in general, um, low severity values are um, usually between often between you know negative 25 and 100 150 or so um we're going to edit this edit the coloration so we can do the properties so we're going to go we're going to right click on duplicate go to properties and start changing the colors so what we can do is actually you're going to double click on the most negative one i've already set up these colors you can choose whatever colors you want, but I typically use green for unburn, mint for um, low, yellow for uh, yellow for moderate, and red for high. You can just what you can do is you can click on these different values in the color table. So, I, for example, I could get a different green like here. So I can click anywhere. If I click on the color table and then click in the color triangle where I want, so you can see it's almost the exact same colors what I have. I'm just gonna move it right here. You can do the same thing for moderate and high if you want. You know, maybe you want more yellow, so that looks pretty good. Let's look at mint. You now we click right there. It looks pretty good for low, and then red. Yeah, looks pretty good for high. Now you want to click on the dark green since this is a low value. Hit OK. You can see dark green, and then you hit apply. And so you can see all the um, scan lines are coming up as uh, unburned, which is fine. You then want to double click on the next one, which is negative 150 in this case. Hit OK. Apply. You'll flip see some more green pixels. I keep going for a little bit more, so negative 100. Change some more. Let's do negative 50. And zero now. Let's see why everything looks like at zero. Okay. Now you can see you're getting pretty close. It's, you know, it's somewhere probably between zero and 100. You're starting to get a lot of the pixels outside the fire um, showing up as dark green. But we don't really know exactly where it is. Um, we do know that the posting off the body was three, the turn of each is 32. So the burn on burn threshold and this low threshold is probably somewhat close to uh, three plus twice the standard deviation or 67 or about 70. So it could be about 70. So let's see. Let's just click on, um, so we'll click on zero. Let's change it to a different color. Let's change it to a uh, burn color and see what it looks like. Apply. Uh, it's way too much. So we know that's probably not the threshold. So maybe our estimate of 70 is good. Let's look at 50. 
that. 50. Apply. So 50 is looking pretty close. We're still getting some scattering. Probably under 100. But let's try 70. So what we can do is we can actually add another. It doesn't say it's in the manual, but you can. You can add whatever number you want. You add a plus sign. And double click on this, put 70, plus some color 70. Let's just hit apply, see those thick picks will show up. Oh, that starts to fill it in pretty nicely. It's looking pretty good. Um, so we're getting pretty close. We're still missing a few pixels. So let's change that to make it a little bit higher. And we've already kind of done the work. We kept taking, changing these numbers up to about, you know, 87. And you can see it's uh, it's looking pretty good. It's matching the color scheme nicely. So we know the low is probably around 87 or so. If we start changing it too much, just to get our exploding pixels. The other thing you can look at within this imagery is kind of go between the post fire and the pre pre fire, and see if your unburned areas, like right here, are kind of matching up with the unburned areas in the fire perimeter. And they are pretty well, so, you know, 87 is reasonable. It's not too bad. So, we've kind of figured out what the, what the, um, unburned is. But let's start to look at some of the low, the low severity, low values. So we're going to start at, you know, somewhere above. You know, it's probably not going to be that high. It's probably, not, it's probably below 250 between, probably. We don't know that for sure. Click on the duplicate, right click on it, properties. I start playing with the low threshold. Let's just go, I'm just going to start coloring the low, go from 100 up, and see how that looks. So, yeah, just trying to fill in some of that. It doesn't look like it's too high yet. Again, you're still filling in some of the low. Still looking pretty good. So it's at, you know, it's around, it's at around 200. So we should start to look and see if, you know, we, we don't know exactly where it is, but we're estimating it to be, you know, probably under, in this case, the direction standard 374. You take it out a little bit further. Let's see. You can always recolor it later back. So for that, okay. So now we're starting to get a lot more nice uh, low severity. Finally, we're going to go 350 and apply. We're getting pretty close. Let's look at 400. See if we need to come in at moderate. So we're just trying to get on the edges. So 400 probably is, you know, not bad. Looking pretty good. Uh, in the original exercise, you stopped around 374. So let's take a look at our map, see what it looks like. So again, we're kind of, um, we're looking pretty good. Again, we have, we're, it's not exactly the same as the exercise because we're kind of masking out the, the screenshot as well. But you can see that the, uh, Flows are looking pretty much like what the exercise shows. So we're going to go, um, we're going to test out some moderate uh, breaks and just see where they start showing. So we're going to right click on duplicate again, properties, and we're just going to go out to about um, right around 550 or so. Let's just look at the yellow. It's a little time consuming, but it allows you to kind of adjust the values. And you can always add more categories, like I showed earlier, if you don't think that it's narrow enough what you're seeing. A 600 apply, I'm trying to get quite a bit of yellow, quite a bit of moderate, potentially. Um, so why don't we just stop right there on 550. It's close to the, um, you know, 565. That was suggested. So we're going to stop there and actually start looking at the um, RDMBR to potentially estimate the high severity. Generally, um, 
high severity DMVR breakpoints are generally above 400, not a bad starting place. Um, but they often, often also start a little bit higher at around 600. So what you can do is sometimes if our DMVR works in your area, you can actually look at the RDMVR values to um, kind of help you estimate what the DMVR is. Otherwise, you just know it's kind of high and that it really should, you should only see high severity kind of in these. Uh, this one, dark red areas. So let's look at our map again. So you're kind of seeing these dark red areas in the center. These are where the high, high should probably be. So let's start looking at some high values. We're going to use the RDMBR again to guide us a little bit. So I'm going to bring in the RDBR. I'm going to say properties. I'm going to, I'm going to change and do 22 levels again, but this time I'm going to do again. I'm going to do pseudo color, phrase or I'm going to invert them. I'm going to go from minus 700 to 1100. I'm going to go equal interval, discrete, oops, discrete. And I'm going to set it to 23. Classify. Apply. Okay. So let's take a look at it. That's looking pretty good. So now we're actually going to start the threshold. In. So we know that high is generally, again, it's going to probably, let's start a little bit. Let's start. Um, it's going to generally be above, be above you know, 600, generally. Um, I'm sure there's uh, options where that, that doesn't always happen, but. Let's take a look at it. So we're going to go to properties. We're going to start coloring these red. So 1100 red. Red. You can start to see some of the red show up in the fire scar, only in those high severity areas. And we're going to go all the way down to. No, around 600 or so. We're starting to see a lot, a lot more high potential high severity. So let's just go down, we'll go down to about, you know, like I said, it's about 640 is an okay starting point. So let's just change this value right here to 640 for the fun of it. And what we see is that these are potentially high areas of Brinsford. So now we can go to the, um, the post fire. DMVR image, not the duplicate, but the other one. We're going to edit it like the other one and say, you know, we've got 23 different classes, so we're good. We're going to actually start to go, again, start from 900 and go down. I forgot to mention that you should probably make sure this one is on. So that, oops, not this one, this one. You can see there was some no data values and some red showing through. What we're going to do is actually start coloring it. And so we're going to start high and start going lower. So we're going to start 900. And I've already done this. So if we keep doing this, we're going to get down to about, you know, 600 and stop. And for the exercise, we actually calculated it if we wanted to down to about 565. So we're going to go down to 565. We could have just gone to 550. It probably would have looked pretty good. It would probably be about the same range. Okay. Apply. Now let's flicker between the two. So if I look at, zoom in a little bit more. If I look at the two, here's the DMBR. RDMBR. You can see that the RDMBR is a little more complete, so you might be able to lower it a little bit more, but 
you know, for the most part, the high is pretty good. So that's looking pretty good. So you can then turn this one off, look at the duplicate, and go turn all these higher than five sixty five. How this changes break to five uh five sixty five. Change all these red. Hit apply. Okay, let's take a look at it. So we look at our duplicate. And it's looking pretty good. We could also bring in our, you know, our actually severity threshold of one up here. We can just flick it between the two. Um, there it is. So you can see the breaks of it's looking pretty close. Not perfect, but pretty close. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to actually save your um export this color ramp, you could use it later. You could go into right click on the duplicate image, go into export color map to file. Let's just save it. We'll go to D. Let's put color um severity color ramp or something. Hit save, and that will save your, your color ramp out so you can apply it another time. Now we kind of figured out. Um, what the breaks are. In this case, we can go back to the fire mapping tool, and we think they're more likely to be 87, which makes sense. 18 is really low. 326, which is a little bit lower than the original, but it's not that much different. It's only about 40 difference. And then the high is 565, so a little bit lower, but only 30. That's not too bad. Then we can hit. One thing you want to do is, if you're going to threshold it again, make sure you remove your image. Okay. From there, let's go back to the tool, hit threshold, and threshold is complete. So we go to our fire folder and bring in the gap mask. So we look at it again. Oops. DMBR6, it's looking pretty good. So we did it, I guess we did miss some lumber area, but looks pretty good. We can also do, I forgot to mention that you can also enter another mapping comments. In this case, we enter none. So we're basically almost done. We can then, in this case, we feel like um, this is complete, that so we've done a good job. We can hit complete, hit update mapping, which updates the mapping to complete. And then we can generate metadata. And we hit, hit the button generate metadata. It says metadata completed. If you look in the file folder, it is right here. Where is that? Sorry, just a second. Right here, this text file. So if you open up the metadata, we have all the information about the scenes that were used, the thresholds that were used, you know, that we calculate DMBR and RDMBR. And now, you know, we calculate the RDBR offset, how many acres the fire is. So we captured a bunch of information from metadata. It's not um, necessarily FGDC compliant, but it's a start. So, you know, in conclusion, we successfully mapped a fire using the automated thresholds and thresholds that we generated. Um, the automated thresholds are pretty close, but they won't be for every fire, especially if you do single team. And overall, it looked pretty good. You know, we did a pretty nice job on it. And um, yeah, it looks good. So at this point, I, we're done with the exercise. And we're ready to pass this back to Cindy and Amber to tell us about the Group on Earth observations, followed by a demonstration on the Global Wildland Information System. I will be on at the end of this session for the question and answer period for any questions you may have on the QJS FMT exercise. Over to you, Cindy. Thank you, Josh. That brings us to the group on Earth observations. 
The Group on Earth Observations, or GEO, is comprised of 105 member countries with a goal to improve the availability, access, and use of Earth observations for the benefit of society. The GEO Work Program selects and prioritizes activities under the eight different societal benefit areas listed here. Wildfire activities fall under disaster resilience. GWIS is a joint initiative of the GEO Work Program and Copernicus, which is the European service that delivers near real-time data to users on a global level. The goal of GWIS is to provide a comprehensive view and evaluation of fire regimes and fire effects at the global level. GWIS builds on many ongoing activities listed here. NASA recently funded several projects to enhance the current GWIS, so you will be seeing many improvements to the system in coming months and years. The GWIS viewer can be found at the website listed here. Next, I will be showing you some features of the viewer. The viewer has several different components, including fire danger forecast and rapid damage assessment. The fire danger forecast provides daily maps of one to 10 days of forecasting fire danger level. This forecast uses meteorolog meteorological data received da daily from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. It's mapped as very low, low, medium, high, and very high. And it has a spatial resolution of 16 kilometers. The rapid damage assessment includes active fires from MODIS and VIRS, burnt areas from MODIS, fire missions, and fuels. The active fire data are available from MODIS at one kilometer spatial resolution or VIRS at 375 meters spatial resolution. They are available for 24 hours, 48 hours, and seven days after the fire. The fire missions data are provided by the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. Fuels are provided by Lucretia Petinari, who created a global fuel bed data set in 2015. Currently, GWIS has been used operationally by the Emergency Response Coordinating Center of the European Commission. They coordinate disaster relief worldwide on behalf of the European Commission, which is a major donor in case of disasters. Here's an example of a map created of forest fires in Chile in February 2017. On the bottom left, the fire danger forecast map for the next day is included in the information packet provided to fire managers. Here's another example from multiple bushfires burning in Australia, also in February 2017. Here you can see the very high and extreme fire danger in the forecast map in the regions that were experiencing larger fires. The report also indicates that over the next 48 hours, the hot, dry weather conditions were expected to continue with no precipitation in the forecast. This is especially important for fire managers on the ground when making tactical decisions for their firefighters. Here's a final example from the recent devastating fires that occurred north of San Francisco, California. These fires burned in the Napa Valley wine region and into urban areas of Santa Rosa, destroying many homes. Again, you can see the fire danger forecast for the next day to help prepare managers on the ground. Next, Amber McCollum will do a short demonstration on the use of G GWIS. Thank you, Cindy. So today we're going to provide you with an overview of the Global Wildfire Information System Current Situation Viewer. As Cindy mentioned, um, GWIS, is a, a joint initiative with GEO and Copernicus. And the real aim here is to provide a comprehensive view of fire effects and fire regimes on a global level. And the current situation viewer provides 
the fire danger forecasts, actively burning fires, and fire emissions. So first in the exercise, uh, you can follow along with me or you can um, just watch and listen and then complete these steps later on your own. Um, but we're going to go through the steps of the exercise that we've provided um, on the website as well. So if we first go to the Global Wildfire Information website here, you can see some of this information. And then we're going to click on the current situation viewer here on the right side of the page. So this will take you to examine the um, situation viewer. And we're going to just first explore some of the features um, of the viewer here along the, the right hand side. So we have this open and close layers sidebar where you can um, just turn on and off the, the map options that we'll discuss here later. You can also search for a region of interest and the map viewer will, will automatically take you to that area. You can use this reset map feature to come back to the standard global view of, of the viewer if you're zoomed in at a lower level and just want to get back to the main overview. And then using the zoom in and zoom out features as well. You can also zoom to a specific area. So if you click on this feature, you can draw a rectangle to a region of interest and the viewer will automatically be updated and take you to that region. Again, um, we'll be using the reset map quite a bit to take us back to this normal um, standard screen here. You can also set the viewer on full screen, which is what I'll do for the remainder of uh, the exercise here, with the exception of going to a few extra websites to show you some things. You can also use this function um, to share your location and find out where you are located currently. So if you allow the viewer to share your location, um, you can see that there's this blue dot that just was created. So if we zoom in here, again, you can um, use your mouse to zoom or the, um, the select feature area, and you can see that we're located here at NASA Ames Research Center um, in Mountain View, California in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that's a nice little feature to orient you um, where you are. You can also use the switch base layer function to change the view, the standard view of the layers below all of the information. So for example, if you're interested in the open topo map as a viewer or the open street map, uh, whatever your preference is here really. Um, and we're just gonna stick with the standard Google map hybrid here. The last feature here is the show legend feature, and you can use this to display the categories of any of the data that you have mapped um, here as one of your options. So you can always turn that on and off to really identify what you're, you're looking at here. Okay, so now let's examine some of the data layers here on the left side. So the first thing we'll do is just turn on the country boundaries It'll take a moment to display, and then you can see all of the borders here. The next thing we're gonna do is click on this information icon um, about the fire danger forecast section. And what this should do is open a new um, browser, in uh, open a new tab in your browser here that describes what the fire danger forecast is. So you can um, get more information here. You can also learn about what the ranges are, so how they're um, distinguishing these categories in terms of the fire weather index or the FWI. So you can see here that the fire danger is mapped into six classes from very low to extreme. Okay, so now if we go back to the viewer, we can identify and take a look at some of the other indices that are included in the fire danger forecast. So we see things like initial spread index, buildup index, the fine fuel moisture code, the duff moisture code, the drought code, a ranking, and the anomaly. So I've also provided you with um, a website that's really helpful to understand what these indices are and how they're different. Um, and this is on the Canadian Wildland Fire Information System. So if you take a look at this website here, 
you can see some descriptions of uh, these indices and what they mean and how they might be different. Um, so I encourage you all to, um, if you're not familiar with some of these indices, to take a look on this website to um, get more information here. Okay, so now we'll go back to our viewer. So with the rapid damage assessment, you can view um, the, these features in terms of a select date range, whether it be the last seven days, the last 30 days, 90 days, the fire season, which they identify as um, January 1st of this year to the current date, or you can select your own custom date range um, using the calendar icon here. You can turn on and off the active fire data. Um, so these are active fire locations from MODIS and VIRS. And again, um, clicking on the information icon, we are taken to a page that really describes what's being provided um, as part of these layers. So the MODIS and VIRS active fires are um, essentially identifying areas that have a distinct, um, very hot signature in the, in the data and they're flagging them as active fires. And the MODIS active fire uh, data is provided at a one kilometer resolution, while VIRS is provided at 375 meters. So VIRS is able to detect some smaller fires um, and can also really assist in the delineation of larger ongoing fires. So you can um, get more information here about, about these um, features and you can also um, find uh, a little bit more about the active fires through this fire news um, option here. So we'll just go back to the viewer. You can also look at burn areas from MODIS. And this uh, provides you with a little bit more information of how the burned areas are, are calculated with um, MODIS daily images at 250 meters spatial resolution. So again, this is a product um, from MODIS. And again, you can get some more information about those details of, of what's being displayed here. We also can view fire emissions. And um, you can take a look at some different types of fire emissions, whether it be black carbon, carbon dioxide, particulate matter, which is a really commonly um, used metric. And then finally, the fuels layer shows um, this uh, layer that was developed in, in 2015 from, from a paper uh, produced that identifies all of the um, vegetation and also incorporates the fuel bed. So again, if you click on the information icon, you can be taken to uh, the link to the website of the uh, paper that was produced of this layer that is the fuel characteristic classification system. Okay, so now that we've explored uh, the features of GWIS, let's um, do some examining of fire danger. So now um, we're, we're just going to hit the reset. We should be in the same view. Um, and we're just gonna make sure that everything is unchecked except for the country boundaries and the fire danger forecast. So depending on the date that you visit the website, you'll see the fire danger forecast will be a different date here. So the, the date might be a little different than um, the current date that you're viewing if you're following along with me. Um, and every day that you come in, it'll, it'll update to the specific date that you are viewing the, the data and then an eight day range out um, in a forecast. So the first um, index that's shown here is the fire weather index. So based on um, the map that you're seeing um, in the webinar window and maybe the um, map that you're looking at on your browser, um, can you identify and, and um, possibly type it into the, the um, chat window here, what regions around the globe look to be at a high risk for fires currently? So I'll just give you all a few seconds to um, take a look around the globe and maybe identify regions that might be more um, at a higher risk for fire currently. And I'll go ahead and show you the legend here as well.
So you can see here that um, some of the regions that are at high risk for fires currently are portions of the southwestern United States, southern Africa, northern Australia, and parts of um, Eastern Europe here in Russia, Ukraine, those types of areas. So we're just going to examine, um, we're just going to zoom into the southwestern U.S. and examine what some of these features look like. So you can use this zoom to specific area tool and then just create a um, rectangle and it'll take you a zoom into the region here. So this region um, is an area that has experienced pretty extreme drought this year. And there also have been some recent wildfires um, happening in parts of Colorado. So what we can see here is the, the currently the FWI as the index. So now you can toggle between some of these other indices based on the information that you um, want to receive and um, how these indices might be a little different. So if we go ahead and switch to the buildup index, what we see now is um, a little bit of a different categorization of the fire danger in this region. So um, you could take a look at the um, description of the built up index from the Canadian Wildland Fire website and maybe think about how that's different from the FWI and why we um, may not see as many of these regions in the very high fire danger category um, as they've been a little downgraded when we're looking at the built up index. Still, there's a high risk for fire in these regions, um, but it's something to think about how um, the different indices, what they're telling you and how they might change. So now if we use the drop down um, menu and take a look at the fire danger ranking, we can see um, that as of this date, when um, we are looking at the viewer here, that much of the southwestern US is, is in that highest fire danger ranking. Um, of 98 to 100 here. So this might indicate to fire managers that they need to be um, on high alert and can expect some um, pretty major fires um, occurring during this summer. So now with the fire danger ranking um, still selected, we're gonna go ahead and reset our map to the global view and um, We'll go ahead and let this load. And now um, we can start to see some of the same patterns that we observed when we were looking at the FWI. You notice um, parts of the southwestern US. Um, it looks like southern uh, Africa is, isn't ranked as high as some of the other regions. And what's really uh, noticeably different here is the uh, a large portion of Canada um, ranking in, in that higher category here um, for, for fire risk. So now we're going to um, take a look at the um, rapid damage assessment and take a look at some active fires. So if we go ahead and turn on the MODIS and the VIRS layers, um, we're gonna just uh, give it a, a minute to load here and we can see um, the active fires from different time periods. So if we just click on the last seven days, we see MODIS and VIRS dots of where they've identified active fires. And then you'll notice here that um, what we see are the active fires from MODIS are identified as dots and from VIRS, they're identified as triangles, and they are displayed differently based on when they occurred. So you'll see the different color ranking based on um, the day they occurred. So what we'll do now is we'll zoom into this region in Finland that was recently experiencing some pretty major drought conditions. So again, if we use the zoom in tool and, and just come into um, Northern Europe and fl Finland in this area, um, what you may or may not see is that the, the region is at a high risk for, for wildfires. 
You can also see that par parts of Poland here and parts of the Ukraine are um, shown as having um, a high ranking of, of fire danger. And what we can also see now as we start to zoom into these regions is potentially um, correlating or comparing the fire danger in some regions with the active fires that we see. So we can turn on and off these layers and um, especially outside of Moscow here, you can see quite a few active fires identified um, by the um, MODIS and VIR sensor in this region. And it is a, an area that is experiencing um, a pretty high danger for fires as well. So now we're going to use GWIS in order to examine a particular set of fires that were burning um, recently in Siberia. So this spring, the Siberia's experienced very warm, dry weather, um, and a large wildfires occurred at the end of um, early May 2018 in this region. And on your exercise, you can see a, a picture of one of the those fires burning from the Sentinel satellite. So on May 9th, a fire blazed near a pretty large city in Russia. Um, and you can see that Sentinel-2 image here. So now we're gonna take a look at some of this within the GWIS viewer as well. So now we're just gonna reset our map. We're just gonna go ahead and um, turn off the fire danger forecast layer and um, just have the country boundaries still turned on. We see that there. Now we're gonna select a custom date range. So we're gonna click on the calendar icon here, and we're gonna select the range where we knew those fires were burning. So we're going to come back and select April 26 as our start date. And then we're gonna select May 25th as our end date. So we're using a period, a window of 30 days within our, um, to show the active fires here. And we'll just give it a, a second to load. And again, making sure the MODIS and VIRS um, active fires are selected. And then we're also going to take a look at the fire emissions data. So we're going to turn on the fire emissions and then select particulate matter, which is a really commonly assessed um, fire emission. And you can also obtain that from a remotely sensed data as well. So now we're going to um, zoom into this region of um, southeastern Russia. And again, we can do this by zooming to our specific region here. And you just give it a second to load and it'll start to load in um, these data. So what we are seeing are the active fires. Again, we can take a look at the legend. We are seeing the active fires from MODIS and fears along with particulate matter. So you can see the, the different categories here of particulate matter. And again, going back to the fire information, fire emissions information, if we wanna um, get a better idea of what these categories mean and, and how we can interpret the data there. So what we can see here, um, if we turn off the fire emissions, we can see that uh, there are fire detections from MODIS and VIRS in the last 90 days. And that's just because we've selected that within our time window um, in our custom date range here. And then if we turn back on the fire emissions, you can see that the PM 2.5, the particulate matter, overlaps with a lot of these large fires in the region. So we can actually zoom in to this area and this large reservoir here is the same reservoir you can see in that image from your exercise from Sentinel. So you can start to identify um, where these regions of the fire were and the emissions. And depending on the zoom level, sometimes the, the layers will show up or disappear, but you can kind of play around with um, the different types of data being displayed and um, the emissions there. For example, you know, looking at things like nitrogen oxides here as well. So there are a variety of different options you can take a look at. Um, to compare the, what's happening on the ground with what we've identified as active fires. 
So finally, the fuels layer provides you with the um, types of crops in the region. So you can compare um, what's burning, what type of emissions are occurring, and then also compare the type of vegetation that we expect to burn in this region. So here it looks like the majority of the area is a mosaic of crops and vegetation um, burning around this reservoir where the fires are. So this might be an area at risk for um, some sediment deposition into the reservoir, which could lead to problems if this is being used for drinking water, for example. Um, so really comparing these data gives you a starting point for maybe investigating further into um, some of the questions you might have about what's occurring with these fires. So that concludes the overview of, of the GWIS uh, current situation viewer. And this is a viewer that they are um, continuing to evolve. There will be new tools incorporated into this viewer, um, such as the country profiles tools, which are under development currently. So I really encourage you to come back and, and take a look at this and see how the, the website evolves in the future. Um, but this was a, a great example of using the data to assist in visualization and providing you with an overview of the fire areas as well as emissions and can be a, a first approach uh, to, to provide you with some insight on, on what's happening there on the ground as well. And in the exercise, we've included a few additional resources, um, particularly the European Forest Fire Information System, which can provide you with some more background on um, this system and some of the, the resources that they are, are using um, and incorporating with, with GWIS um, for analyzing fires on the grounds. So um, that concludes the exercise here, and I will now turn it back over um, to Cindy Schmidt. Thank you, Amber. So at this point, we're going, we're going to have a Q&A session. But I wanted to remind you that if you have any questions after this session, you can contact either me at my email address here or Amber McCullum at her email address here. If you have general questions about RSAT, you can contact Anna Prados. Or if you want more information about RSAT in general, you can go to our website. That has information about this particular webinar, including all the exercises and the homework links. Um, the recording will be available in a day or so. And then you can also see uh, future webinars that we'll be offering in the next few months. So at this point, we want to thank you all for joining us. We'll stay on the line for any questions that you might have. Uh, Josh Picot is also joining us uh, for questions and answers in case you have any questions about uh, the QGIS tool that he presented last week. <laughs>